Welcome to episode 11 of the First Responder Wellness Podcast, the show where we talk about wellness, mental health, leadership, and what it takes to have a wellness culture within your organization. My name is Conrad Weaver. I'm a filmmaker and a podcast host and adventure seeker and the director of the groundbreaking film, PTSD 911. Thanks for joining us today on the show. My guest today is Mike Ming. Mike began his distinguished firefighting career as a volunteer in his hometown of Forestville, California in 1991. He worked as a seasonal firefighter for Cal Fire for a number of years and then went full time in 1998 and became a permanent employee in 2000. Mike worked in a number of key positions in his career at Cal Fire, including as a captain on the elite aviation unit. In 2020, he promoted to staff chief, program manager of the newly branded Behavioral Health and Wellness Program. Mike had a part in the PTSD 911 documentary, and he has since retired from Cal Fire and is enjoying life outside of the fire service. Stay tuned for my conversation with Mike as he talks about the steps he took to prepare for his retirement. Hey, I really appreciate you listening to the podcast. And if you think others would too, please subscribe and share. That helps us get the word out to others. And if you have some time, leave a review. Let me know how the podcast is doing. Today's show is brought to you by PTSD 911, the documentary film. If you're looking for a resource to get your officers, your dispatchers, your firefighters talking about wellness and mental health, order PTSD 911 for your agency. Visit PTSD911movie.com and use the coupon code SAVE25 now to save 25% on your purchase. That's PTSD911movie.com. Coupon code save 25 now and we'll send you the film and digital toolkit for your agency and you can start watching it and using it in your training right away and now here's my interview with mike ming well mike welcome to the first responder wellness podcast thank you so much for joining me today yeah, thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Yeah, I really, uh, I've learned to appreciate you and what you do. Uh, you and Sequoia came up to, uh, out to the West Coast for the launch of our Coast to Coast bike ride. But not only did you come to the West Coast, you came to the East Coast for our return out at Ocean yeah. City. So I want to say thank you for that. Well, it was our pleasure. It was really fun. Yes, it was. And it was, it was uh, inspiring to see what you were doing. I mean, that's really what led us to to jump in with you and, and support you as much as possible, because what you're doing, and I've told you this, is very sacred, very mm -hmm. sacred work um, diving into this particular arena. So thank you. Yeah, well, it's my privilege and my honor to to do this work and and now this podcast and what we're doing to to kind of continue that conversation uh, yeah. that the film has stirred up in me. Now I'm kind of working to continue that conversation through these interviews and through the podcast that we're we're doing. So speaking of that, so tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into the fire service? Uh, you know, why did you get into the fire service? Can you tell us that? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it basically points to my older brother, Max. Um, I remember as a, as a teenager, we, we shared a room and um, he was a volunteer firefighter in our hometown and he would get up at night. They had this giant VCR looking <laughs> plectron, it was called, and it would go off and he would jump up and he would respond to the station and it and at that point um i started getting the adrenaline and the cortisol dumps because <laughs> i was like oh what's going on what's happening um and so i basically followed in his footsteps and when i was able to when i lived within the district i started to volunteer that was 1991 um i, I volunteered uh in our hometown uh from there um i was also playing baseball i was i i thought perhaps i was going to be a ball player and i was i was pre-med during uh that time uh but my heart was just falling straight into fire and i couldn't stop thinking about it when i was studying and and when i was on the ball field i just always wanted to run calls because i was a volunteer and i i got the bug so um i just pursued that i dropped basically everything got a degree but i i, I dropped everything and and i started volunteering in my hometown and in that um there was a search for that uh permanent job which we all wanted and so we we, we would uh, take classes and things and also volunteer and do our best to to um find that permanent job as a firefighter. I eventually found a seasonal job in 1994. Um, and uh, through 98, uh, I was seasonal. 
um, until I was full time. And then in, in 2000, I became a permanent employee. Um, backing up to 91, one of the things that that kind of formed uh, my person, who I was as a firefighter, who I was um, as a leader, eventually, um, I think we're all leaders, mm. by the way. If individually, and it comes down to the individual mm-hmm. in every moment. Um, but I was exposed to a uh, critical incident. Um, mm-hmm. I wasn't on the call itself, but um, I was able to, and we wouldn't do this these days, is allow outsiders in, but I was able to sit in on a um, critical incident stress debriefing. And I sat as a young man um, and I watched my older mentors, the people who taught us how to fight fire and extricate, um, you know, structure fire, wildland fire, medical aids, you know, uh, vehicle accidents, hazardous materials, all the things, these tough, you know, basically hicks, I'm going to say that because we are, you know, of country. Mm -hmm. um, And um, that, that was very impressionable upon me because I watched them break down. Um, It was a very, Mm, traumatic call uh, involving a young, a death of a young uh, child. Mm. And I saw that there was an association. It, uh, they'd seen stuff before, but it was really interesting to me. And it molded me um, that my tough mentors uh, went around the room and they all broke down. Mm. And that was the first time I saw the association that comes with the trauma we're exposed to um, and how it affects us and how it relates to our own family because they had young children happened to be a young girl um, of their own and they couldn't necessarily separate that. Mm -hmm. They couldn't think, yeah, these are my words. They couldn't necessarily think that "Mm, this was not my child as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, So moving forward into my career, um, I always carried that with me. I did as much training as possible. And I told myself, If I'm going to get into this, I better pay attention to this particular aspect. Yeah, the fighting fire, the operations, the the whole camaraderie is is one thing. But there's this other side of it, this emotional, psychological side of it that um, I was exposed to very early um, that I've always carried throughout my career. Do you wonder what it was within you, within your background, in your training, maybe your family, you know, that caused you to be aware of that, to kind of say, Hey, this, this is something I need to pay attention to. So I've, I've often thought about that. And, and I think to the best of my ability that I come up with, it was so impactful. It was such an impact to watch these tough, they were all men. They're these tough men, um, break down like that. And I had never seen that. I mean, these were men that played with my father in softball week. I grew up with them. Mm-hmm. And so I never saw this side of it. And so that really, for some reason I paid attention and, and I don't really know why, but I was in school and I was studying and I was reading and, you know, s- discovering spirituality, things of that nature. And, and it just really had a giant impact on me. And for some reason it snapped right there. And I said, okay, I'm going to set this course to try and remember about this mm-hmm. and to try to, if exposed to those types of things, um, do what I can to mitigate any type of, uh, emotional psychological response. And that would carry me through to, you know, um, I would eventually retire out of that program. Yeah. So, so fast forwarding in your life, you, you know, working with Cal fire and you guys had an opportunity to develop a, a program for, for the agency. How did that come about and what did you do? So, um, so I was operational. I so, so kind of go back a little bit. I was operational. I was a wildland firefighter, type three engines. I was also a structural firefighter vehicle. You know, so it was an all hazard um, scenario. Uh, Cal Fire is not only wildland firefighter, but they're, they're all hazard. So um, contracts with counties and things of that nature. Um, so I was operational, but I always had um, this in the back of my mind about when I was exposed to those things, I almost, I, I feel like I almost died a few times. Mm-hmm. And so that's very impactful mm-hmm. on, on a person. <laughs> um, and so I always had that thread in me. And so eventually when I, I, I was working off of a helicopter, uh, as a captain and then, um, I, and then all of a sudden I wasn't, um, and I won't get too far into that, but, uh, that was pretty devastating. Mm-hmm. And then, so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to focus on this area I wanted to promote. And then this program, 
that was called Employee Support Services um, that started about 1991, or not, excuse me, 99, 2000 with one person. And then about 2004, there was two people, happened to be my partner um, where I was permanent, who went over to the program. And so there was two people. Um, and then by 2012, uh, they were starting to build out the program a little more. And then by 2014, I actually promoted as a battalion chief into the program. And there was five people. There was a deputy chief, uh, three battalion chiefs, and one administrative or non-uniform uh, person. Um, so the, I, I walked into a program that was established. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we started building from there. Um, as a battalion chief, I was... Um, I started out as the substance abuse assistance program coordinator for the state um, where I would help folks get into recovery. This is, by the way, this, this program is all voluntary. It's completely confidential. Mm -hmm. Eventually we would, we would help uh, pass a law called AB 1116 and then also SB 542 presumptive PTSD. So, so that's a little bit later, but um, the, um, the original push into that, I was a battalion chief and I was just, you know, covering a helpline, uh, traveling around the state, um, having confidential com conversations with folks, getting, getting them into recovery or into PTSD retreats. Uh, there was really only kind of one or two at the time. Um, and so we worked through that, worked through that, worked through that. And then eventually my, my, uh, deputy chief, um, had uh, retired and a new one came on. And then, so we worked with him. And then when he retired, I, uh, went for that job as a deputy chief and, and I got it. So I became the program manager, deputy chief program manager of this um, program, which was called employee support services. Now it wasn't a permanently funded program as far as the budget was concerned. Um, it was, um, it was executive support, basically the director, um, Chief Pimlot, um, the retired director, uh, kind of was his baby and he pushed it forward and he had great support. And I, before he retired, I was working, uh, um, basically for him, um, but through HR. So my, my boss was the HR chief. Um, but, uh, he was inspirational and he had a bunch of support and then the new director came in, um, behind him and they tasked me with writing a budget change proposal so we could get a permanent funding source, which would be permanent fund in the general fund of Cal fire coming from uh, state government. And, um, and in that, uh, building out more positions and that permanent funding. So I took a lot of um, uh, my life away trying to write that. <laughs> uh, here's an operational guy coming in and um, in this uh, environment uh, that is Sacramento. Um, as you can imagine, um, there's a steep learning curve as to how things go, what things do, what are control agencies, what happens, um, you know. And so with the executive support and then the close uh, contact with the governor's office and legislature, um, I, I pushed this budget change proposal through. Um, it wasn't just me. There's no I, me in leadership. There's only we. But the leader has the accountability, the liability, the authority, you know, um, all of that stuff. So uh, we pushed through a um, budget change proposal uh, with executive support. That was the key. Um, and it was very it was successful. Mm -hmm. It was successful. We had a permanent uh, funded budget and then we grew to uh, 27 positions, permanent positions from five that were basically not permanent. They were just pieced together. And from there, we rebranded the employee support services to the behavioral health and wellness program. And I got to say, I mean, I'm retired and I'm not quite following it. I'm kind of disconnected. So they could rebrand. They could be doing different things at this point. I'm not really up to speed, but this is just my experience. And so um, with the budget change proposal being successful, the 27 programs, we started hiring a bunch of people. Um, and it wasn't necessarily something that everybody was jumping into. Mm -hmm. I, I felt it. I was like, this is important mm -hmm. based on the 91 experience. Right. But not a lot of people were like just beating on the door to get into it. There were a couple and they're in the program now. Um, so we had to screen folks. We had to really, um, mm, find out who, who was good fits, but we also had to follow all the rules of control agencies, Cal HR, you know, um, that type of mm -hmm. thing. As far as hiring, mm -hmm. you got it merit based. So that was a challenge. And eventually we would get to 27 uh, uh, permanent folks. And we had 
two components of it. Basically, there was the wellness unit, which is uh, physical fitness, nutrition, and cancer awareness, a group of folks, uh, just outstanding individuals. And then the ESS unit, which was uh, kind of separated into the operational side, which was uniformed folks, basically battalion chiefs and deputy chief. And eventually I would be a staff chief, right, uh, from the new positions. Um, and then the administrative uh, staff, which is kind of non-uniform, but it's the administrative staff that worked with the, uh, there's a ton of folks. There are a ton of folks in all throughout the state that make Cal Fire run and they're administrators and they're kind of in the back seat. Yeah, you see the planes, you see all these things, but there's some administrators back there and everybody has the stressors. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter who you are. As human beings moving through life, they're stressors. Mm -hmm. So um, we had those particular uh, groups uh, um, moving throughout the field, doing trainings, doing um, uh, curriculum development through our CFTC in coordination with uh, the folks, the, um, the chiefs out there um, who wanted to implement a wellness and they had their own wellness unit, but we worked with those folks. And so we, we got to the, the training uh, center um, in concert with those folks. And we implemented um, this program, this awareness, eventually the PPTs that you actually um, uh, show in your film um, that, was crucial because we wanted to get to people early with this information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So they were armed in themselves to go um, throughout their career and hopefully retire happy. Mm -hmm. So for, for those who don't really know or understand Cal Fire, give us kind of a big picture. How many people work for Cal Fire? What, what do you guys do across the state and that kind of thing? And so th this group okay. of 27 is serving this larger Group. Yes, about 8,000, 8,500 at peak staffing along the way. They've uh, since um, uh, approved some staffing increases. And I believe, don't quote me, but I believe it's somewhere going to be around 10,000, 11,000 folks, mm -hmm. both uh, operational admin and administrative. And so there's, um, it's the state of California. Mm -hmm. We are California's fire department. And historically, they uh, it was born out of protecting the forest lands because the forest plant, the wood and all that stuff was California's economy way back. I'm talking about way back. And uh, they wanted to put the fires out in order to protect their resource, uh, which was income for the general fund uh, for California. So there's 21 different geographical units. Um, most of them have couple counties or several parts of several counties or just to make it easy there's there's one county that is a geographical unit and uh there's 21 unit chiefs throughout the state that are running those particular um units right and so within those units they have wildland responsibilities 31 million acres um in california that are um statutory responsibility to protect um those encroach upon um municipals uh, uh cities and, and and in counties and so there's a lot of population within there there's also federal lands that are within california and there's coordination there so cal fire not only is a wildland firefighting agency from history. Um, we have the finest um, aviation force, we believe, and a lot of people around the world who, who want to model us uh, aviation force in the world. We have um, ground troops, uh, we call it iron. So there's engines, there's dozers, there's um, mm, there's crews, you know, the, the crew buggies that show up with a bunch of folks. Um, there's a state fire marshal is a part of that. But within these particular counties, um, there could be contracts with those counties to be the fire department. So uh, it's not only wildland fire, but there's certain contract counties that, um, like, let's say, for example, L.A. County, uh, the state gives L.A. County funds to protect the wildlands. So those aren't employees. But um, in other counties, uh, Cal Fire is the fire department. So it's all hazard fire department. Um, and so this very dynamic Cal Fire is it's it's uh, the aviation, the ground resources. And then when major incidents occur, uh, obviously wildland fires, but earthquakes, uh, train derailments, anything that's largely impactful to our, our culture and our society. We have um, incident command teams um, that are called upon Fed uh, Forest Service Federals. They have those as well, but they're primarily looking at the wildland fire. So uh, we have incident command teams that come in and we set up our 
our um, our little cities in in um, close to these incidents, and then it's full of uh, finance, logistics, operations, planning. Um, it's a command and general staff, so the incident commander um, is in, in charge. But there's all these folks, and so we go out there and we mitigate uh, the incidents the best we can. Um, so yeah, so it's an all hazard fire department. It's born out of wildland, and um, it's um, it was a fascinating. Uh, department to work for because there was multiple opportunities to do a lot of things. How is trauma or incidents? I mean, how are they different from like structure fires or accidents versus some kind of wildland incident? What, what's the, I mean, how are they the same? How are they different? Those kind of incidents as far as, as far um, as the, the, the kind of the visceral response for the people on the ground, you know, what they're experiencing. Yeah, so there's individual threat. So wildland firefighting, like I said, I almost died a few times. There were some very close calls, and so there was in. And I was younger, so it didn't. I didn't know it affected me so much, right? So um, there's the individual threat to personal safety and crew safety. So that's one arena where you think you might die, mm. and we're we're going into a very hazardous, very dangerous situation with training, with our head up in mindfulness, you know, and making sure that we're making the proper decisions and, and doing those things. Um, yet we're also exposed to, um, medical aids, vehicle accidents, structure fires, deaths of many different types, suicides. And so when you walk into an environment and you're exposed to, let's say a household with a, a suicide completion, um, that is hugely impactful and originally basically they said suck it up buttercup this is what we do mm -hmm. um i was told to pull up my skirt which is neat that was really fun um don't cancel me i'm quoting everything <laughs> <laughs> Just, these are all quotes um and so um when you walk into an environment where there's this visceral emotional family based on an, a loved one's passing um that personally impacted me much more, mm -hmm. absolutely much more. So our brains from a lot of smart people who had talked to me and I, my readings over the decade that I was in the program, our brains really can't separate necessarily amygdala hippocampus prefrontal cortex can't really necessarily separate that. That's not our, mm -hmm. the association, that's not our child mm -hmm. or that's not me. Right. And so we, uh, it's kind of like a snake bite in the dark. Like it kind of comes out eventually because we see all these calls. There's a backpack, a proverbial backpack. This is a call. This is a call. And it, eventually it gets heavy and we're, we're trudging through life. And it could be just one tiny little pebble that gets in there that'll bring you down mm -hmm. to use an analogy. Mm -hmm. So the difference is in wildland firefighting, there's a lot of nature. There's a lot of, there's a destruction. I mean, the paradise fire it was, it was the same thing that I just alluded to with medical aids and structure mm -hmm. fires and vehicle accidents because we saw a whole town sure. destroyed. We had employees that uh, had lived there, retired employees. We had, uh, there was CHP, there was sheriffs, there was a lot of first responders in that community that um, brothers and sisters that uh, they, their, their town and their community was destroyed. And so it's very impactful. So across the board, just to summarize, the traumas and grief that we're exposed to enter us no matter what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And there's, I'm going to say there's less of it in wildland firefighting, except for the past several years because of the destruction mm -hmm. and the deaths and the, the, mm, the infernos that we have seen um, versus you're going to medical aids in a city every day and structure fires and you're within a lot of uh, the community and, and, and seeing them. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that yeah. is suffice. Yeah. And I know that just from things I've read and heard that some of these fires like, like paradise fire, um, you know, not only do you have the destruction of the buildings and homes, but then you have in the midst, you have bodies that are there. And, and what I've been told is just the smell of death is in the air. And I'm sure that's got to have yeah. an impact. Absolutely. So our olfactory nerves, you know, the body keeps the score, right? So our, when you see something, you feel something, you hear something, you smell something, you taste something, if it's associated with trauma, it doesn't leave. Mm -hmm. Your body says, oh, this is a threat and stores it for the next time it comes up. And then you're right back to it. Mm -hmm. So the smell of 
bodies either decomposed or burning um, is not anything that anybody needs to experience, except it's just part of the job. Um, so that the, those things are triggers mm -hmm. and they are large in part, a part of the unconscious snake bite in the dark that comes up when, a, uh, in us, um, for example, um, I can, I can smell a certain grass that's cured in the Hills where I live. And it reminds me of my childhood. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just like, I'm right back to my childhood. So when you see these things on TV and you've actually, if you're watching TV or the news and you've actually experienced it, you can actually smell it. It comes right back. So, so those types of things, uh, those triggers, um, stay with us and it's just our job to process them, become friends with them and be able to live with mm -hmm. them. So what did you, you guys do in your program and what did Cal Fire do to help mitigate uh, the the results of those things with with your with your employees. So uh, we had several programs, uh, little uh, distinct programs. Um, I think that the the biggest impact that I uh, was pushing was that training to firefighters and uh, administrative staff, first day folks, and their families, and mm -hmm. their families. Because it's not just the employees an important that piece. come along. For Such an important it's piece. It's a huge piece. Yeah. It, if you miss that, you're 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 remiss mm -hmm. in in what your your uh, process is. So um, the the early education information and training um, to folks, uh, so new folks, so they're set up for the rest of their career. But additional training for folks like myself who were trained to suck it up that are, you know, um, engineer, firefighters, engineers, captains, uh, chiefs that have 30 years on the job that are kind of jaded, still trying to reach out to those folks to educate them about uh, this uh, process and this, this system, because it, I believe it is the number one thing to keep us ha happy and healthy is to know this. And then we can teach you to fight fire, right? So we get to them early. We get to the folks who haven't had the training. So we developed these programs. We had a peer support program. I wrote them down because I'm, I'm, I'm just flushing <laughs> stuff as we, uh, uh, we have a peer support program, which we trained, uh, peers and units, um, with different types of training that are associative to uh, critical incidents and, and what to do and recoveries and, and PTSD and sleep, uh, um, uh, sleep depth mm -hmm. and, uh, suicidal ideation, those are those types of things. And so we would train them up and we would use those folks cause we would have peer support. Mm, when, when requested, we would have peer support, uh, at incidents for folks to, to come off the line. So you got, you got to get to them right away in order to process that. We had an employee assistance program. Uh, we are managers of that. And so we sought out culturally competent clinicians, which I know you're mm -hmm. aware of. Um, the people uh, that have our licensed therapists or our PsyDs or psychologists that are working with first responders that either were first responders themselves and then got their degrees or in licensure um, because they can speak the language. Mm -hmm. Because it's very important when somebody who has been stigmatized all these years that if you reach out for help, it's weak, which is not true. Mm -hmm. Um, as soon as you reach out for help, when you feel like your backpack's too heavy, if you don't have somebody receiving you on the other end that speaks this culture, it'll shut the door right away. Mm -hmm. So uh, the employee assistance program that we had, we had uh, a critical incident stress management is just a tool. Mm -hmm. It's just a tool and you can pull it out when necessary. There's different levels of it. Um, and then not everybody can do that one. That one, that one takes a, a special person to be able to show up with humility and listen, and then just follow the, the guidelines. Um, again, we had the, the administration and the family component of it. And we we've reached out to families and we had family, um, um, Ooh, I'm slipping my mind that the, the family retreats or sessions to where we inform the family, tell them exactly what their person is doing. Um, and then we had the uh, wellness units, which is the physical fitness and the ESS unit components, all of that. So I'm kind of losing my train of mm -hmm. thought. So refresh me. So well, well, one thing I want to say, I love what you guys are do doing. I got to visit uh, the training center up in I own and uh, chief Wheatley was, I, I think he was in charge there. And I was there for a train the trainer where he brought in a yoga instructor that was training, you know, 
chiefs, battalion chiefs, I'm not sure who all the people were in the room, but then they would go back to their individual places and train people locally. And I thought that was just fascinating how this is uh, an initiative that you guys do to, to, to teach yoga to some of these, you know, people that probably like yoga. I thought that was like for, you know, soccer moms, you know? Right. Uh, right. Which, which is exactly so. Yeah. Chief Wheatley uh, was a division chief, assistant chief out there. And he was uh, kind of heading up the, the wellness uh, program at the CFTC. And actually, um, he he um, he got the job that I left the staff chief hmm. of the program now. So Chief Wheatley's now okay, the staff I chief. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll, um, just, I'll have to and send so, him a text uh, and, and say something. Yeah. Too, so. yeah, yeah. Reach out to him. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he's busy. Yeah, sure. I'm sure he. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So my own experience, I can tell, uh, yeah, reach out to him. Um, so yes, the, the yoga, um, we did a lot of studies, talked to a lot of people. Um, and, um, as, as you see in the film, if you've seen the, the folks that have seen the film, um, I allude to breathing, uh, meditation, mindfulness, yoga as certain individual things that we can do to help mitigate the exposures to these trauma and the grief that we have. And these are scientifically backed and it's getting more and more and more. So the yoga not only increases the tidal volume and your flexibility, but that, that process is, is related to realigning our central nervous systems. So when we get exposed to trauma, there's the amygdala, which is our basic instinct of fight or flight. Then the um, hippocampus is the neural pathways that go up that create the information for the fight or flight to the our executive center, the prefrontal cortex. Now, when all of that is firing and firing and firing, it, it affects our uh, HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and our adrenal glands, all of the chemical dumps, everything. And so our body is toxic and offline if we don't flush it yoga is one of those things that gets down to the central nervous system to help realign and flush it along with physical exercise and eating nutritional nutritionally properly if that's even a phrase um and so um the yoga when we introduce that or the even breathing techniques like um it's it's it was so interesting um as a as a staff chief, I would stand up sometimes in front of, uh, the training center folks who were going through the new, um, students. And, um, for me to stand up there and say, yeah, I breathe, I meditate, I do yoga. That was one thing. So modeling the behavior and leadership, but really sometimes it took saying, you know, the Navy SEALs do this. They, they do combat breathing or box breathing, or they do this yoga. They know how it affects their bodies and what they can do uh, to continue to perform at this high level. So the yoga that you had experienced there was that was the first implementation. Now, not everybody's on board with yoga because sure. mm -hmm. we all come from different backgrounds and, and everybody's got their opinion. Everybody's an expert mm -hmm. in, in some things. So you don't have to do it. But what we're saying is it's scientifically backed to help you realign your central nervous system, get your emotional, psychological, and your physical uh, components and bodies back in line to be happier and healthier. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the breathing, you know, just really oxygenating the brain. And, and the mindfulness or the meditation is, is those two kind of are in the same thing. I mean, I, I talk about it in your film, so I, I describe it in your film, but it's the meditation is just being aware that our thoughts and our anxieties and, and regrets are, are constantly pulling us away from right now. And the mindfulness is just being able to go, wow, I'm, I'm out of myself right now. So I need to be right back here to make this important decision, especially when we're in operational mode. Right. And so the yoga is just another thing. And then there were myriad other uh, techniques, more professional techniques and, and, um, modalities that we would use with the culturally competent clinicians. Yeah. I just found it you know, fascinating that this was happening. And then uh, I, I guess it's also something you guys teach for the new recruits and for the, cause, cause, cause the class I was at, these people were seasoned veteran firefighters, leaders in, within Cal Fire, but you guys bring it to yes. the Academy as well to the new recruits. Yeah. So those folks that you were with, uh, we, we trained the mm -hmm. trainer. It's exactly what you said. So, a nucleus and then they go out across this giant state and then they start training and it's just you know it's just a concept that works yeah. that's uh, uh, that's awesome so let me ask you personally in in your journey how did 
how did learning these things help you manage that, that those things in your own life? Well, the jury's still on on that one, Conrad. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not, um, I believe this, nobody is perfect sure. and we all are fallible human beings. However, um, in 1991, when I was exposed to that, that critical incident and watched my mentors, that set the tone. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in my spiritual, uh, encounters, just as an individual, you know, uh, comparative religions, looking at all the world's religions and, and, and what's, you know, asking the big questions for me. Um, I found that, um, and just, it's just my opinion. So again, no, no canceling, um, that all of the world's religions are, are separated by language and geography. However, and I apologize to anybody that doesn't believe this, but this is my belief. Um, we're all one. And then we just all are looking for uh, happy, healthy, kind, loving communities, respectful of each other. And I think that's truly what where the spirituality, I'm going to call it spirituality, um, comes from. I found uh, that uh, Buddhism was um, more closely associated. I'm not a Buddhist, more closely associated with my mindset of um, the ocean and the forest and ironically the fire and the, you know, the water and the dichotomous, uh, arena there. Um, that is my spiritual ground is, is the ocean, the lakes, the water, the cold water, um, the forests, as you could mm-hmm. see, um, and, uh, just the exploration of nature and, and basically primitive skills. I do primitive skills, survival skills, that type of thing. It's how Sequoia and I got mm-hmm. together. Um, and so those particular things on a daily basis, uh, waking up and saying to yourself, okay, let's do this and having that mindfulness mindset. So we train our mind to be able to stay aware of the past and our exposures, not only like to in professional, but on our relationships and not run from it, but, but face it and, and process it. And, uh, meditation really, and come back full circle, meditation really allowed me to be aware of those things. And then ironically, fast forward, now we're, you know, to the end of my career, we're teaching it in, uh, as a tool, uh, for, um, our folks. And, and so that meditation process really, I believe carried me, it kept me somewhat sane uh, but again, I'm fallible. I, I have made major mistakes, both personally and professionally. Um, and we don't uh, necessarily dwell on that. But we don't just forget about it, but we we pick ourselves up and we move forward. And so those particular tools that we just alluded to, uh, those are things that that I use not on a daily basis. I could I could be better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, those are tools that I could use. Now, the other thing is, is uh, aside from the nature and submerging into the icy waters and uh, surfing and things of that nature, um, it is family. Mm-hmm. It is community for me um, to have loving support of uh, my partner, of my two daughters, uh, watching them grow um, and us growing together. And now that I'm retired, having the time to be able to spend more time with them. Um, and, and just the community that the small community that I live in, this, just the wonderful people that were around, that's what fills me up daily. I wake up to the redwoods. I have wonderful, loving family. Um, the physical exercise, we got great hikes around here. We got an ocean, not too far away. We've got rivers and lakes, not too far away and forests, not too far away. Um, that. I basically jump into and expose my body, my spirit, my mind to, um, and just in the awe of it all. So I'm great. I told you I almost died a few times and that's, that's, that's true. That's true. I felt like I would, my life was on the line a few times, if not Mm -hmm. several. Um, and so I wake up every morning grateful with this mindset, with the experiences that I've had and the work that I've done with meditation and the mindfulness awareness. And I'm thankful. I'm, gr- I'm mm-hmm. thankful and grateful that I get to breathe another day and witness my daughters in their life and my community. And I do that with my partner and, and having a good solid partner that is open, honest, communicative, and able to 
fall on their own sword as I will too in mistakes and relationships. That constant process of, of looking at yourself in the mirror in an honest look, um, again, not perfect, but an honest look and say, okay, I could use some work here, but just trying to be as positive as, as one can be in every moment. Um, is basically kind of what I got. That's awesome. And I, and, and you alluded to that, that you have retired. I know a lot of people when they retire, they, their, their wheels fall off and, you know, they go, they go sideways. So how have, wh- what's that process been like for you? And how do you, how do you not lose that identity as a firefighter and, and now into your retirement years? Yeah, that's a great question. I was, exposed to and this is goes back to why did you pay attention to the cism for some reason i paid attention to uh older uh mentors of mine that were uh i'm just gonna use the one classification old crusty (laughs) captains and they can teach you about fighting fire and things and they that's what they were they were a captain fire fight and i watched them I watched them retire. And this is why we had working on in the program, we're working on retirees. Like we cannot forget mm-hmm. about them. Sure. So I watched them retire and the wheels fall off, as you say. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. I don't want to do that. So, um, and for some reason also originally my, mm, my identity never really was a firefighter. Very proud. Mm-hmm. Very happy, honored, absolutely honored to be a firefighter, uh, an EMT, you know, um, serving uh, in service mm-hmm. to, to our community. Absolutely very proud of that. Um, but I also had this other, for some reason, I had this other thing that was like, well, that's a job that I'm honored to do that helps pay and feed my family and put shelter. But I've got all these other things that I want to do. So it was, it was from the beginning, really. Um, that, um, I, I saw and throughout my career, um, I saw that, okay, I would, I don't want to fall mm-hmm. off the cliff when I do pull the pin. So I was an exercise throughout my entire career. Mm-hmm. Now, um, towards the end of my career, um, I started preparing. Mm-hmm. I still like, like I'm saying like five years. So I'm like, okay, five years out. So what am I going to do? A good friend of mine, retired 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 battalion chief out of San Jose. He said, well, in, in the next, the two years before you retire, he's like, if you want to do this thing, when you retire, start doing it now. So you, it's a seamless transition into it, you know? And so I took that advice as well. Um, however, uh, the one thing I think Conrad that, um, I absolutely think has ushered me into being grateful for a profession and honored that I can just drop is because it took me away from my family and it took a lot of my time. I mean, we would be deployed on, as you well know, like for days, month, months, you know, that's not always the pop, the case months, you know, cause you got to get rest cycle. Um, but I'm done. I'm, I'm good. I experienced that. Mm-hmm. And, and again, the jury's still on, out on whether or not I, I came out unscathed. <laughs> I know I didn't. Um, but that's my process. And that's what the program uh, offered me was that di- deep dive into, okay, what's going on. And so that parallel, that program going into retirement, it was, um, it was a, uh, a blessing really to, to uh, be a part of that program. And it kind of just ushered me out the door and I was set up. I was set up um, emotionally and psychologically and physically knowing these things that I need to do. And so uh, I was ready to go. Um, and I won't get into a lot of the politics and things, but it's a crazy world out there. And then you have movement all the time. And so the the support ebbs and flows on, on anything that anybody's doing. Um, and especially in programs that are relatively new, uh, 99, but the permanent program and the build out of the program and the support that goes on there, I was tired. 
Mm-hmm. I got I got to admit I was tired. It was exhausting. I was honored. Um I feel very proud of what we as a group did uh with executive support and what we pushed forward. Uh but it was time and and there was no doubt in my mind that when I, you know, because of our formula, retirement formula, when I turned 50 January 20, that was it. That was it and I and I say thank you to my uh department that I had worked for. Um, and I say thank you to my program, the people that I was leading that I worked for that mindset. Um, and, uh, I, I do, uh, like it's cliche, but I do miss the good, uh, uh, contacts and people that I was exposed to. Um, and yet I don't miss the, uh, the operations of the thing. I was a helitack uh, captain mm-hmm. fighting fire off of a helicopter. And for me, that was the bee's knees. That was it. And I got to experience that. I was grateful and I'm honored to be able to, they pointed to me and said, yeah, go ahead and go for that. And I became a helicopter, private helicopter pilot because of it and these things. And that was my operational firefighting uh, experience. That was, that was the top of things. And I got to experience it. And again, almost died. And so I'm grateful I came out unscathed in that, in that way. And I'm grateful for all the experiences and the people I worked with in the past, but it's time to, um, find my own true identity, um, outside of the confines of that. profession. Well, I think you've done a great job in that transition just from my limited perspective and what you're doing. And, uh, I also like, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I know you do some kind of photography with, uh, mushrooms or something like that or things you find in nature (laughs) oh yeah yeah so this is part of that nature connection so um about 20 years now um i got this bug uh we've got some great uh wild uh, uh, mushroom hunting areas around um their my area and uh i i got this bug i, I started looking at them like oh what are, what are these what is a mushroom you know i've never i never liked them as a, as a child um but then once i started getting exposed to folks that were teaching me and i got this little book and i was starting to read it, it's the, it's a great book and i started looking at like paul stammett these like these these uh mycologists that are really pushing the mushroom and i started you know, um, researching it a lot more. And, and what I found is that the mushroom world, the mycelial world is amazing. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it predates us, um, whatever your beliefs are, um, it predates us. And these things are fantastic and so fascinating. And I started taking pictures. I would take my little phone and I would just crawl like on my belly, like a lizard. And I would just find these mushrooms. And then I would look at them and I would key them out and I would wonder what is it and what does it do? Is it, is it, uh, uh, is it going to kill me? You know, there's a handful Mm -hmm. that can, it could destroy your liver. Is it medicinal? Is it a good food? What kind of proteins? And then there's all these other ones like, you know, cause there's, there's psychedelic mushrooms out there. So you got to know what you're doing. (laughs) Otherwise you're going to die. You're going to go on some crazy trip that you never (laughs) wanted to be on or, or, you know, so, so you're, what you need to do is, uh, is really look at those things. And that's what I've done is I've, I've dove into it. So whenever the rain comes, um, you'll find me in the forest on my belly, um, certain spots, picking those ones that I absolutely know. And I absolutely love, um, uh, eating the wild, uh, mushrooms from the, the forest. Yeah. So I, I love it. And my, my, my partner loves it. My, my daughters love it. And so, um, it's just a, um, it's a fascinating world to dive into. And that's, and that's what I'm doing now is diving into those particular worlds, you know, that I, that I love. And I have, that's awesome. Them. Well, next time I come out there and it may not be too far away. Well, you'll have to take me out to the woods, see if we can find some of those. Absolutely. I think that would be fun. Absolutely. Yeah. So we got the rain, the, the rain promises the mushrooms. And so there's certain times sure. for certain substrates, certain species. And so uh, we'll, we'll have to do, we'll have to go exploring no matter yeah. what. So. Sure. I know we're working on a screening event down in the, in the, in the Bay area. So, uh, uh I'm not sure when that's going to be. It's probably sometime January, February timeframe. So, uh, yeah, Oh, we'll great. St- yeah. That there should be some mushrooms in that, in that time. Yeah, we'll have to stay in touch. Well, uh, Mike, it's been a real privilege having you on the program and, and just, I know your journey has been amazing and the work you've done has, have, has been amazing. Congratulations on that. Congratulations on your retirement. And I know you got some uh, fun things planned. So my question to all my guests is, what's something fun you're doing in the next month? In this next month? In the next month month or two, yeah. (laughs) 
So um, I'm going to be uh, traveling south uh, on the California coast to uh, hang out with uh, some of my best friend, uh, friends in the world, uh, family that uh, um, when I was a snowcat operator in Kirkwood, when I was a seasonal, um, I, I ran into my friend Marty and I'm going to go down. I haven't seen them um in a, in a long time and i really want to go spend time with them and then uh my my in-laws have a house on the beach down there i might stay there if it's available um i'm thinking of traveling doing some camping by myself um uh, either north or south and uh, check out some surf spots some camping spots um and then um we will be going to uh watch a friend of ours who plays uh in the nfl um we're going to be um traveling across the country and uh um, hanging out with them watching a game and then i will be going to costa rica for uh, a month um in late uh, november sequoia will join me and then i'm going to fly my daughter out for her 20th birthday um, which is uh, December 20, and we'll be coming back on that day, but I'll spend 10 days with my daughter down in Costa Rica, which I've never been and I want to explore. That's, so so those are kind of fun things that are happening in the next that's few awesome. months. That's awesome. Well, Mike, thank yeah. you again for being on the program. Thank you for your contribution to the film and your work there. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you the very best in well, all you, that you do. I appreciate you, Conrad. Um, you're doing sacred work. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Say hello to John and family. Um, and um, and we need to continue this conversation. And Conrad, you're the tip of that. And I appreciate you very much, sir. And I love you. Hope that's not too too much, but we've gotten to yeah. know each other. I'm, I'm grateful mm -hmm. for you um, and your family and every all of your people that you're touching. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm very... Uh, proud, happy, and honored to have done what I've done. It's time to move on. And uh, I, I can't wait to continue this uh, journey with you and, and spread that word with you. So I appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike, for being a good friend and for your support of the work we're doing with PTSD 911. I really appreciate you. And thanks to you for listening to the show. I appreciate it. Please leave a review and give it five stars if you think it's worth it. And please subscribe to the show. Also, just a reminder that you can see the video of this content on our Patreon channel. I'll leave a link in the show notes where you can get access to that. We want others to discover this content and benefit from it as well. And remember, you are not alone. If you need someone to talk to and don't know where to turn, you can dial 988 for help. Until next time, be well, take care of yourself and those around you, and go out and do something great in the world.